Good morning. Welcome to Medford United Methodist Church. It's good to have you with us. My name is Joe Monahan. I want to welcome you on behalf of myself and also our associate pastor, Kathleen Stoltz. It's really good to see you. I hope each one of you will take a minute. There's a red attendance pad that's on the inside of the pew. I hope each one of you will take a minute and uh, sign and uh, share with us that you've been here. And if you're visiting with us today, we'd love for you to fill out that bottom part where it says uh, where there's space for your name and address information. And uh, that would be a wonderful thing. We'd love to be able to let you know about things that are going on here at the church. So if you pass that down to the end and uh, pass it back then to the center and making sure that everybody has an opportunity to sign it, that would be a great thing. Uh, I want to share with you, uh, first of all, I'm sorry, I forgot. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers in the congregation. And uh, I'm really grateful. A couple years ago, I preached this Mother's Day sermon. And it was all about, you know, pay paying attention to your family and all these kinds of things. And then um, my mom let me know after watching the sermon that I forgot to call her. Uh, It was probably one of the most embarrassing moments of my life. Um, In any case, uh, a couple of announcements I want to share with you. First of all, thank you to everybody who helped uh, with the Interfaith Hospitality Network this week. Uh, When we host the homeless here in the church, it takes a lot of people uh, to get that done. And so it uh, is really a team effort, and I want to thank you. There's an opportunity that you can still help. There are some bags of laundry that are outside and they're in the narthex. And as you go out, if you take one of those bags with you, take it home, wash it, and bring it back so that it's ready for next time, that's one more way that you can serve. So just take one bag and that would be great. I think that there are several still out there. So I hope that uh, you'll uh, take us up on that offer. There's still also an opportunity uh, to purchase some spring flowers. If you haven't purchased any Mother's Day flowers, um, the United Methodist Women would love to have you purchase some from them, and the proceeds go to support missions. So uh, they're right outside. Last week, we talked about Pedal for Promise. Pedal for Promise is a, a fundraising bike ride, and some of our people are participating in that, and it supports Urban Promise, one of our ministry partners. Urban Promise runs a school and uh, leadership programs for young people in the city of Camden. And so uh, it's a really important ministry. It's a great ministry. I hope that you will consider sponsoring uh, consider sponsoring our team. And you can do that either. Uh, we'll have some folks outside. Actually, I think Pastor Kathleen will be outside uh, to receive. And your uh, And uh, Carolyn Hone will be outside to receive your offering today. And if you'd like, uh, if you don't have any cash or if you don't have your checkbook, you can also uh, go on our website and there's a link there where you can sponsor our people. Finally, I want to share with you, we're starting today a diaper drive, which we've done over the past couple of years uh, for the Christian Caring Center in Pemberton. And so we do a, uh, a diaper drive that starts on, on Mother's Day and goes to Father's Day, and we'd love to have your help with that. We hope to achieve even uh, more than what we did last year. And so thank you in advance for your support. You can just drop them on any Sunday between now and Father's Day here in the Narthex. I think those are all the announcements that I've got. One more announcement you might want to hear. We're going to be hearing some of the music, one of the pieces of music for our special children's musical that's coming up next Sunday at seven o'clock. It will be here in the sanctuary. So you're gonna hear one piece this morning, but you're gonna wanna come back and hear the whole thing next Sunday at seven. So happy Mother's Day, and um, to all of you who are mothers and like mothers to others, um, we welcome you and we invite you to stand and join us in our opening call to worship. The Lord Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And yet we all must learn not only how to give generously, but to receive graciously. For as the scripture says, from Jesus' fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. God's grace is a gift, and the only appropriate response to a gift is to receive it with thanksgiving. Today, let us learn how to both give and receive.
may be seated. And I invite you now to join me in our opening prayer. This morning, we open our lives to your healing love. Remind us once more that everything we have is from you. Open our ears to hear, our hearts to receive, and our hands to act upon what we experience here this morning. Amen. Grace surrounds us. The love and forgiveness of God washes over us. In everything we do, we proclaim the love of God, which is for us and for all people. Thanks be to God. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Let's take a moment now and greet those around us with the peace of Christ. I'd like to invite our children to come forward now for our time together. Any children coming forward? Here come Cooper and Easton. Here comes Eden and Bradley. Yes, here we are. Okay. Hi, everybody. Hi. Is that a bowling ball? No. It's a, just a soft ball that... I did that bowling ball. You like that ball? I like it. Yeah. Well, I brought these with me today. This is actually a... a ball that belongs to my dog. Because when I throw the ball, the dog always brings it back. Sometimes he doesn't want to let it go. 
But when he does let it go, then I can throw it again and he brings it back. So that's how we teach our dog to love us and we love our dog. And so the dog starts to trust us and, and will bring the ball back and knows that we're going to always let him have it again. Now, when you were little, when you were born, yeah. you didn't know how to share, did you? But now you've gotten bigger and you've learned to share. And one of the ways we teach children to share is by rolling a ball to them and then they learn to roll it back. And, what? and that's, hang on a minute, let me finish and then you can talk, okay? So we roll the ball and then the child rolls it back and they learn to trust just like our dog learned to trust us. And then you know that you can share because we'll always give it back. You know what? Sometimes then adults forget that they're supposed to continue to share. And all the adults do is they give and they give and they give and they don't remember they're supposed to take it back. And part of sharing is that you give it back and then we give it back to you. So all of you can help all of the adults learn how to share because that means you give it to them and they give it back and you give back and forth and back and forth, just like the ball. And happy Mother's Day to you. And some of you are learning to play baseball, right? Now, when you play baseball, you throw the ball and you catch it and then you throw it to somebody else. And that's teamwork. All that's about sharing. You pass the ball around. So the ball can teach us lots of different lessons about sharing and trusting that we can work together and that's what God wants us to do, is work together and share with one another. So now, what was it that you wanted to say? Other than Happy Mother's Day, thank you so much for saying that. What else? When I was three. Thank you. When I was three, my sister told me that I could never have the same as my school, and I told her to get off, and I bit her butt. Oh, well, you're, that's not a good thing. Well, you were impatient, and now you're a little bit older, and you're more patient, and you learn to share, right? And we learned that biting people isn't a good thing, right? We want to share. No, we don't bite. Well, you don't have any teeth anymore. I see they fall out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you've, got, you've lost your teeth, and your big teeth are going to come in because you're getting so big. Yeah, you lost one too. Okay, well, let's say a prayer about sharing before we go back to our seats, okay? Loving God, we give you thanks for teaching us to share and for giving us so much that we want to share with others. Sharing is a good thing, and we thank you so much for sharing Jesus with us. Amen. <laughs> okay.
Good morning. Happy Mother's Day. The scripture reading this morning comes from Matthew chapter 26. Now while Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very costly ointment, and she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. But when the disciples saw it, they were angry and said, Why this waste? For this ointment could, not have been, could have been sold for a large sum in the money given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? She has performed a good service for me. For you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. By pouring this ointment on my body, she has prepared me for the burial. Truly I tell you, wherever this good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So we've come to the last week of our uh, series about neighboring, and I think that I've got something that maybe fits with uh, Mother's Day, and I, uh, you know, intentionally planned it that way. You can see whether or not you agree when we're done here. But uh, let's take a minute, let's pray together. God, we are grateful for all that you've done for us, and we're grateful for this opportunity that we have to share and worship, that we have to hear the scripture read, that we have to think about what it is that you have to say to us. We're grateful for your power at work in our lives. And we pray that your power might be at work in these words. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I wonder how many of you have ever had this conversation or one like it. Mom, what would you like for, and then insert holiday here, Christmas, your birthday, Mother's Day? Me? Oh, Nothing. You don't need to worry about it. What, what do I need anyway, right? Moms and dads, I'm convinced, are some of the hardest people to buy for. Because moms and dads are used to giving, right? And what I've found is that givers sometimes make lousy receivers. Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And we teach that in the church. We reinforce it over and over and over. And we do a pretty good job of it. Now, it's to the point where, actually, if I wanted to predict, if I'm somebody who's raising money for a charity, if I wanted to predict whether or not you're likely to give money to my charity, the number one question that I could ask you is, do you attend church? And if the answer is yes, then there's a 70 80, 90% probability that if you attend church with some level of frequency, that I can get you to make a donation to my charity, right? It's well known. So there's this generosity that comes from being part of a faith community. Because here in this place, we teach people how to be generous. Now, if there's a downside to that, I'd say here it is. We also teach people in many ways how to have these relationships that end up being very one-sided. In other words, we teach people how to be in relationships where all they ever do is give. All they ever do is serve. All they ever do is share. Which is not a terrible thing except for the fact that in those relationships, where's the place where the other person can be a real human being that has an opportunity to give back to you. So that's how we end up with these, in my opinion, incredibly dumb Christian sayings. Like, I don't know if you've ever heard people say, well, um, we just wanted to love on that family, right? To love on that family. First of all, it's just a weird thing to say. But secondly, <laughs> um, I'd say, you know, it has within it this really kind of one-sidedness about it, that I'm doing the loving on you, and you're not ever able to share God's love with me. So when we're talking about neighboring, when we're talking about loving our neighbors, it can't be one-sided. It can't be. Because no one likes feeling like an inferior. 
Actually, I was just having a conversation a couple of days ago. I went to lunch with the, pa- the soon-to-be pastor of one of the churches that we partner with in ministry, Turning Point United Methodist Church in Trenton. And one of the things that we were talking about was this idea that often urban churches, and especially you know, since the 1960s, since the white flight phenomenon in the 1960s, um, suburban churches have been the one who have kind of ministered to urban churches. And we've seen that as our role and responsibility. But his question was, well, how do we minister to you? What are some ways in which this relationship can be more mutual? And that was a really important conversation, I think, and one that I hope that we'll continue to pursue over the next couple of years. No one likes feeling like an inferior. And when we're in the position where we're always the ones who are doing the serving, we're always the ones doing the giving, we're always the ones doing the loving, then you know what? We're putting the other person in a position where they feel inferior. So neighboring involves mutuality, always. And not in the sense in which, well, today I host and tomorrow you host kind of mutuality, because Jesus warns us about that too. He tells this story, um, and he tells it about a party. Do you remember last week I said Jesus liked to talk about parties? Well, here's an example. Jesus says, if you're going to have a party, you know who you should invite? It's not your neighbors, it's not your relatives, it's not your friends who will invite you back. Because when they do that, you're repaid. Instead, invite those who cannot repay you. Go out and find those who could never host you and invite them in. And then you will be repaid. Your reward will be in heaven. So mutuality has got to be about something that's more than just quid pro quo. Today I do for you, tomorrow you do for me. You know, we keep score. What I'm talking about is not keeping score. It's about moving to a place where there's a real relationship. Think about your best friend. When you go out and you have a meal together, do you sometimes forget who picked up the check the last time? Does it even matter to you? Do you care? No, because you have this relationship that is based on mutual love and respect. So it's not that important to you to keep score. So it's about getting to a place where we're not keeping score, where we feel comfortable asking for help when we need it. Again, back to your best friend. Would you feel comfortable calling this person at 2 o'clock in the morning? Well, of course you would because they're your best friend. You know that if you really needed help, they'd be there. But you probably are thinking to yourself, yes, but I would never, ever do that. Well, maybe so. But the question is, there might be a day when you need to, and would you allow yourself to? How many times does someone offer you their help? And you say, no, that's all right, I've got it, thank you. Part of what I'm talking about today is getting to the place where we can say, absolutely, I'd I'd love to have your help. In the scripture today, we have this example and a counterexample of how it is that receiving should work. So the story is that Jesus is at what? He's at a party, of course, right? He's at a party, and a woman approaches him, and she has this this jar, and it's kind of a jar. Typically, the way these things were, these uh, they find from time to time in various archaeological digs, they find these cosmetic kind of uh, containers, and generally they are uh, kind of like a long-stemmed vase almost, <clears throat> and everybody who would have seen this woman with this jar would have known that there was perfume in it and and relatively expensive perfume. The kind of perfume that would have been in this jar is most likely uh, something that they would have had to have import from from the Himalayas, okay, from a plant called the spikenard plant. Very expensive stuff and very strong, powerful smelling stuff. 
In fact, this was the stuff that you would use to anoint a body. In lieu of embalming, you would anoint the body with this perfume. And the perfume was strong enough to actually mask the scent of decay. So you have to know that it's pretty strong perfume. And the way that this worked was when you wanted to empty this jar, you would break off the, the long stem. When you broke that long stem off, then all of the perfume would come out. And she did this and, and poured it all over Jesus' head. So you can imagine the whole jar on his head, in his hair, filling up the room with this scent. It's a very powerful, powerful moment. And I'm sure it got really quiet. It's like it's quiet in here now. And then you can hear the disciples start to talk among themselves. Wait, why is she doing this? Why didn't she take that and sell it? We could have given, do you know how many people we could have fed with that? And they start to complain, and it's getting louder as they start to complain. Can you imagine what she would have been feeling in that moment? She's presumably able to hear them, the same as Jesus is able to hear them. Can you imagine how she's feeling? She's offered the very best thing that she has, and these people are complaining. And Jesus, recognizing that this is a moment that is not to be missed, this is not something to be taken lightly, he immediately puts it in the context of what she's offering is an anointing before I die. The others around can't really see this part of the future, but Jesus can, can sense it. And he knows how this might happen. Part of the idea of the cross was that you didn't get a burial when you were put on a cross. For Jesus to be buried was really an extraordinary thing because most people were just left there. And that's the way that it worked. And you were, in that sense, you were robbing that whole family of an opportunity to carry out this last act of love towards someone that they cared very deeply for. And Jesus kind of perceives that this might be where he's headed. And he says, don't trouble her. She's done a beautiful thing for me. In fact, she's anointed me beforehand. He's pointing to the fact that she's carrying out her religious duty in advance of my death. Don't trouble her. The disciples aren't bad people. They're generous people. They understand the value of a dollar. But in this moment, Jesus needs to teach them an important lesson about what it means to receive graciously. And what he says is, don't trouble her. Essentially, his point is, when someone wants to do something nice for you, let them. When someone wants to do something nice for you, let them. Can you imagine if the words of the disciples had been allowed to stand in that moment? If Jesus had just let that go, not said anything? What would it have been like for this woman? She would have walked away incredibly dejected. Now I know that all of us have had at some point the experience of rejecting someone's offer of help, rejecting someone's invitation, Maybe brushing aside a compliment as though you didn't deserve it. All of us have done that. How often when we do that do we think about what it's like to be on the other end of that? Because we know what that feels like too, don't we? Now there are lots of reasons why we do those things. I mean, some of us really can't believe that we're worthy of being complimented. So that's why we brush that aside. Or you know, some of us don't feel comfortable accepting someone else's help. And so we reject that, push that aside, and say, no, that's all right, I, I can do for myself. I mean, this is America, after all, right? We want to earn what it is that we receive. 
But have we ever considered that maybe it isn't the most humble thing to do to turn aside that compliment or to turn away someone's help? That in fact, in, what, in doing that, what we're actually doing is cutting off an opportunity that someone has seriously planned out to serve us, to carry out what it is that Jesus has called them to do in their lives, to love and to serve and to give, and we're saying, no, thank you. Maybe we're not even saying thank you. We're just saying no. If we preach that we ought to do these things, to love and to serve and to care for others, well, doesn't there need to be a recipient of that care somewhere? If all we say is, go out and do this, somebody has to be a receiver, right? We can't all just be givers. It's part of our ministry. So I learned a lesson from a pastor a few years ago, and he had these four words, take all the pies. Really? That's a really weird lesson to teach me. He said, I'm serious, take all the pies. Okay, so break it down for me. What does that mean? And he started to tell me the story. And as I remember it, it was a story of something that happened to him with his mentor. And there was a woman who showed up at the church. She really liked to bake, so she had baked all these pies. She'd been baking all day. I don't know what kind of pies they are. Don't ask me that. I have no idea. But there are lots of pies, 12 pies, say. And so this pastor is thinking about, okay, I don't know how I'm going to use these pies, but she's come in and she said, Pastor, you know, I'm sure that somebody would love these pies. You know, there's got to be somebody who, who could use this, somebody who could need a lift and, and, and would love these pies. He's thinking about it. I think I could figure out like four people. You know, I could, I could take four of them, okay? And just at that moment, his mentor came in and, and saw what was happening and said, Mrs. Jones, these pies are beautiful. Oh my gosh, I can't wait. They're beautiful, wonderful pies. Thank you so much for baking these pies. We'll take them, absolutely. We'll make sure they go to good homes, right? So which one do you think made Mrs. Jones feel better about what she'd done? It's obvious. You gotta take all the pies, right? That's what you gotta do. So loving our neighbors isn't just about us giving. It's also about us learning to receive as well. It's about essentially trusting other people enough to let them love us back. This is an important lesson for us as Christians because you know what? At the core of the Christian faith, and you might not quite think about this at first. At the core of the Christian faith is really a story of receiving, at least on our behalf. It's really a story of receiving. It's not so much about a story about us giving. It's about a story about God giving, but it's about us receiving. The things that God has to offer for us, God's love, God's forgiveness, those things cannot be earned. That's why we talk about grace. We talk about something that is freely given, freely offered to us, and we receive it. And the question is, if we don't learn how to receive from God, we'll never learn how to receive from others, and vice versa. It's a practice that we're always engaging in, learning how to receive. We cannot earn this. We have to just receive it and accept it. I was thinking about this passage from John chapter 1. From his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. There's no limit to what God has offered to us. The question is, will we receive it? So you might imagine this is the challenge for this week. The challenge for this week is when somebody pays you a compliment, smile and say thank you. When someone offers you a pie or a cup of coffee, whatever, don't say, let me pay you for that. Just receive it as a gift. 
when somebody sees you struggling with something, or even if they don't see you struggling, and they say, can I help you? Say, yes, I'd love your help. Thank you. That's the challenge for this week, is to learn how not only to be a generous giver, but also a gracious receiver. Because when we love our neighbors, we cannot turn them into either objects or projects. The relationship has to be mutual. It has to be about something that doesn't keep score. It's willing to ask for help when it's needed and willing to receive help when it's offered. This is all important because that's what friends do. That's what friends do. And all this is part of what it means to be a neighbor. Amen? As we continue now, we'll offer God our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings. If you are visiting with us today for the first time, we want to say a special word of welcome to you. We thank you for being here. You don't need to feel obligated to put anything in the plate. We look forward to seeing you again very soon. Let's continue now by offering God our gifts. I selected uh, this piano piece this morning entitled uh, Blessings. Uh, it's a uh, honor of mothers on Mother's Day for all the blessings that they do bring to all our lives. Uh, Thank you. 
you please pray with me? God of great gifts, on this Mother's Day, we acknowledge how much you mother us by providing for us and caring for us. As we have been abundantly provided for, so we give abundantly to the work that you give us to do, the work of the church, the care for those who are poor. Accept these gifts in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Let's take some time now to go to God in prayer. I invite you just to be uh, just in silence for a moment as we begin. God, for all that you pour into our lives, we give you our thanks for all the joys, all the celebrations, for the opportunity today um, to celebrate mothers. And we are grateful for those who have mothered us in our lives. We ask your blessing upon um, all those who are mothers and for their daily struggles. And just ask that you be at work uh, through all of those struggles. Help moms to be the best moms that they can be and moms that they want to be. We pray for all those uh, women who uh, really want to be moms and who can't for whatever reason. And so we ask your blessing upon them and, and your power to be at work in their lives in all kinds of ways. We pray too uh, for moms who, who struggle uh, just to be the moms that they want to be. And we pray that you will bless them with encouragement and with strength. God, we thank you for the many ways in which you bless our lives, through our families, through our friends, through our relationships. Lord, we thank you for the beauty of this day, for the beauty of the earth, for your work all around us. God, we are just so grateful as we're gathered here with your people. We pray your blessing upon our young people who are graduating and uh, all those who are going through this time of transition that happens um, this time of year when people start to look forward to what's coming next. And Lord, we ask that you be at work to settle people's hearts and people's minds and um, to guide our young people as they go out into the world and determine that next step in their path. We know that there are a lot of things that we're concerned about today, a lot of uh, concerns, a lot of um, really heartfelt, uh, painful things that we offer up before you today prayers for health and, and wholeness for all kinds of situations, for those uh, dealing with addiction, for those dealing with all kinds of medical conditions, for those who are um, wrestling just what, with what it means to grow older. Lord, we lift up all those who are on our prayer list, and we uh, share with you uh, some particular concerns today for, for uh, Bonnie Morgan, who was recently diagnosed with cancer. We also want to lift up all those who are dealing with loss, and especially uh, those who have lost loved ones and those who have lost pets in recent days. And we pray today uh, for the Harriet family and the loss of their, of their, of their beloved dog. Uh, and Lord, we're, we know that uh, we share our lives with, with our animals and that they are wonderful to us. And uh, we just ask your blessing because we know that it hurts. Lord, we pray for this world that we live in. Um, there are so many places we can look around the globe that need our focused prayer and attention. Uh, places like Iraq and Afghanistan, Syria, Lord, throughout Africa, in nations like Nigeria where there are struggles between Christians and Muslims. Places all over where there is uh, political turmoil and unrest among people. And Lord, we pray for this nation as we go through this elect electoral process and pray for wisdom and discernment. Lord, we pray too for our delegates uh, to, the, to the General Conference as the United Methodist Church starts its General Conference this week. And we know that there are a lot of issues that 
church is wrestling with, we know that there is um, just some talk that troubles us about, about splitting apart. And, but we just pray for wisdom and for discernment so that the United Methodist Church might continue to be united. So be at work in the hearts and minds of all those who are attending that conference. God, we ask your prayers or ask your blessings on this church in prayer. We know that there are many things that you've given us to do. And as we continue to plan uh, for our ministry, as we continue to plan for this building project, we pray that you give us wisdom to make good choices and right decisions to be able to uh, pursue the path that you've called us to. God, in everything, we give you thanks for all your great gifts to us. And we offer ourselves and our lives before you now. We pray all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. go forth in this place, go forth not only to be generous givers, but gracious recipients of the grace that God pours into your life so that you might pour it out for other people. Go forth in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.